When you think of AI in large language models, you probably think of two different specific architectures, one being transformers, which easily makes up 95% of any AI, anything anyone's ever seen or interacted with, and Mamba. Mamba obviously has some interesting attributes, and there are areas where it's actually much better than transformers, even with all of the crazy accelerator work going on. But what I want to talk about today is a new architecture, and an architecture that sort of strikes an interesting hybrid between what Mamba and transformers both want to offer, but takes a completely different approach. Approach, a completely novel approach. Now, I wouldn't call this a frontier model because this is very early in its development. So there are things you can point to in ChatGPT or even local models like Quen 2.5 Coder that this model can't really do well yet. But when it comes to open source AI, novel architecture is something that I think is incredibly important. And today, that's why I want to talk about liquid foundation models from Liquid AI. So why is this model better than Transformers or Mamba? What can it do? What can't it do? And where can you use it right now? That's what I want to get into in this video. So welcome to AI Flux. Let's get into it. Liquid AI is a company that I just came across basically on Hacker News. I had not heard of them before. Most of their team is based in Boston, which is exciting because that's where I went to school. And their claims are very interesting. And what's cool is they actually have a demo to back this up with. We'll get into some of their benchmarks in just a bit, but I think they're being mostly honest. The way they describe their new announcements today that they've been working on for just about a year is announcing the first series of liquid foundation models or LFMs, a generation of generative AI models that achieve state-of-the-art performance at every scale while maintaining a smaller memory footprint and more efficient inference. So what's curious is in theory, they're focusing on smaller memory footprints, and we've talked about a lot of other very small models that focus on efficient inference in the past. So I'll be curious to see why they think this is better and where kind of the capability lines up. So they've announced three different sizes, and this is harder to talk about in terms of benchmarks because it's fundamentally a different architecture. In the same way that there are certain areas where models like Jamba or Mamba are hard to talk about when you're comparing them to more synthetic transformer-based models. So they've released a 1.3 billion parameter model, a 3 billion parameter model, and a 40 billion parameter mixture of experts model, which it's kind of curious why a mixture of experts only comes into play at that size. You can see here that uh, in this chart, they show LFM models, transformer models, RNN-based models, and hybrids. And they claim here that on MMLU Pro, their model actually performs best in class for each of these rough size classes, which is pretty cool. Now, obviously it takes time to really flesh out these benchmarks and understand where they fall short. So this is a really interesting claim, but let's see how they back it up. So their takeaways are pretty straightforward. They say that they're announcing these new models. They've announced three different sizes, which they claim each achieve a new state of the art in their own right. Right now they have these LFMs running on Liquid's Playground, on Lambda Chat, on Perplexity Labs, and what's interesting is they supposedly already have Cerebras inference support for these as well, which is curious because you'd think that Cerebras would only work on transformer-based models. And they also claim that this LFM stack is being optimized for NVIDIA, AMD, Qualcomm, and a number of other hardware stacks, which is curious given that AMD just released a bunch of their own LLMs as they try to sort of claw back their relevance in the space. They give some insight into why they built these models because they say here that one of their big goals is to build private, edge, and on-premise AI solutions for enterprises of any size. So not just for enthusiasts, but for companies in theory. And that they're scaling these and expect to introduce new and better capabilities across various industries as time goes on with specific applications that are tailored to these industries. Now I'm curious about that because this model is great at a number of things, especially at sort of the core benchmarking task, but there are certain areas where it really falls short. And I'll get into my thoughts on that in just a bit. So the smallest is for resource constrained environments. So basically just a really small edge device. Um, Dense 3.1 is supposedly for edge deployment specifically. And their mixture of experts model is basically just the biggest version of this, probably where they started, that's meant for tackling more complex tasks. Now, how do they define state-of-the-art performance? So obviously they were very big on their MMLU scores, but what's interesting is they do quite well across the board. So if you look at GSMK, Heloswag, and ArcC, it's quite interesting. Now, the one thing I will say about these LFM models that is quite interesting is their really small models have an incredible context length, and I'm surprised they didn't mention this. For instance, their 1.3 billion parameter model has a 32,000 token context window, which I just flat out have not seen before. And I think the performance numbers in this case require a pretty big caveat, because there are certain things this model actually just can't do, and it's hard to tell if this is just because of its uh, non-GPT architecture, 
or whether or not the data just wasn't quite there. And it's early enough that this will probably wildly improve, but it'll be a curious thing to watch. So the performance of LFM1B is incredible just given its size. LFM3B is also very interesting given its size. It also has a quite large context window, but unfortunately there are models like Llama 3.2 and 5.3.5 that have had a you know over 100,000 token context window for some time. So the novelty of the massive context window falls off quite quickly. And I should also say that in 1 billion parameter models, Meta Llama 3.2 also kind of outclasses it there. So again, quite interesting. Um, the other big thing here is that this model is around 20% smaller than equivalent model like Phi 3.5 mini, which is pretty cool. And in theory, it also gets close to outperforming previous versions of Llama, specifically Llama 3 and Llama 2 in larger variants like Llama 7, 7B and 13B, which is a huge improvement on its own. Now, LFM 40B is really interesting because again, we're seeing kind of a miss in terms of context length. So it, it's one of the really big drawbacks of this model. And I think it's why it's good at certain things and also bad at certain things. So it has 12 billion activated parameters when it's in use. Its performance is comparable to models that are significantly larger. Well, supposedly the idea behind the MOE architecture here is that it just enables higher throughput and deployment on more cost-effective hardware. I would think it also kind of broadens its capabilities as well. But one thing that they claim this model does quite well is reasoning and just thinking through relatively complex tasks. Now, you might ask like, well, what is an LFM and what is their real advantage? So the biggest advantage of LFMs is memory efficiency. So basically just how you're using memory to complete inference. And they say that LFMs have reduced memory footprint compared to transformer architectures generally. This is particularly true for long inputs where the KV cache in transformer-based LLMs grows linearly with sequence length. By efficiently compressing inputs, LFMs can process longer sequences on the same hardware. So not specialized hardware, just the same GPUs we always look at here. For example, compared to other 3B class models, LFMs maintain a minimal memory in footprint. And what's cool here is you can look at, at uh, Zamba and a few other non-transformer models as well, and you'll see that the scaling is pretty incredible, while also enhancing abilities that Mamba couldn't really get close to. Now, although obviously the context length of this model is low, they bring up a really interesting concept of effective context length. Whereas, you know, you can say, oh, well, yeah, Meta 3.2 has this huge, you know, 128,000 token context length. And the thing is, is that its effective use is in many cases much smaller. And they actually reference a study that looked at this where they found that in most cases, all of these models can only really utilize around 32,000 tokens anyway. The important factor here of LFM3B being that it generally uses most of its tokens all of the time. And this highly efficient context window enables long context tasks on edge devices for the first time. So this is the first thing that it can do that basically no other small model could do on top of being highly efficient with its memory use. So for developers, it means you can unlock new applications, including document analysis and summarization, along with a number of other rag-like tasks that don't necessarily require a lot of the heavy lifting that you would have need prior. So it means way more context uh, awareness in terms of chatbots and doing it all locally. So the idea that you want to use this on an API doesn't really make a lot of sense, but it's interesting. And they say that their goal here is to keep scaling LFMs across model size, train test time, compute, and context length, which is pretty cool. And they say that over the next few months, they'll be giving us some timely updates. Another really cool concept they have here is the notion of the Pareto frontier of large models. And the whole idea here is that in order to achieve the results they want, they've optimized pre and post training pipelines and infrastructure to ensure their models excel across five specific criteria. So knowledge capacity, multi-step reasoning, long context recall, inference efficiency, and training efficiency. Basically just saying that they want their models to roughly be Pareto optimal and not necessarily just good in a number of specific areas that are just application-based. So knowledge capacity basically meaning that um, breadth and depth of information is roughly equal. Multi-step reasoning is pretty straightforward. That just means you can prompt again and again, referencing the same task and get continually better and better informed input after each prompt. Long context recall, which is effectively just RAG, but RAG in this case is kind of not the right word to use um, since they have a totally different way of looking at context. And then obviously inference efficiency is when you're using it, how efficient is it with memory and just how much compute it uses. And in training, you know, how much 
training compute do we have to put in to get gains in efficiency that we see in inference? And I don't wanna to get too technical in this video, but one thing that is important to note is that this is not necessarily a transformer-based model. This is built on a lot of research that only recently has actually been able to actually be applied here, which is quite cool. And they claim here that they've developed a new design space for foundational models, focusing on different modalities and hardware requirements, and that their goal is to explore ways to build foundation models beyond generative pre-trained transformers, or GPTs. This is how ChatGPT got its name. LFMs roughly use a few different notions of... So the architecture that is that makes up LFMs is pretty interesting. So it's based mostly on structured operators. It's a controlled architecture, so in theory, the bounds of how it works are known quite well. And, L and LFMs are adaptive and can sort of serve as a number of different layers um, as the substrate for AI at a number of different scales. So basically that means you don't have to wildly change your infrastructure to deploy either on edge or at a very small scale or a really large scale. Whereas a lot of other models need a lot of kind of helping infrastructure to make that work. And they roughly describe this as a new kind of transformer. So it, when they represent here kind of a, a standard hybrid striped transformer, they show the optimized liquid foundation model as basically a transformer that can reach into different steps of its process. So basically showing that their systems interconnect in different ways. Yes, they can work linearly just as transformers do, but they can reference different steps in inference in a much in a vastly different way. And this here is why, uh, in theory, this model will probably run on Cerebras accelerators because at the end of the day, it is still... At its core, a transformer, it just works in a very different way when it comes to referencing other parts of it. And they mention here that their design space, they mention as the structure of this entire architecture, is primarily defined by featureization and footprint, which make up their core operators, as they say it here. So featureization refers to the process of converting input data, so text, audio, images, video, into a structured set of features or vectors, so effectively tokens. For example, they say that audio and time series data generally requires less featureization in operators due to the lower information density. And the big thing they keep mentioning is the density of the information that this model can work with. And then the other key dimension is the computational complexity of these operators and just what they're doing. So being able to traverse and complete the design space of a structured adaptive operator allows them to maximize performance with controlled computational requirements. So basically saying that you're not just trying to reach at what the most a given comp compute platform can do. The idea is that you know the bounds and you're not just trying to maximize the bounds and just see where it breaks, but you, by having a better idea of its limitations, you can more um, reasonably apply what you do have to give you really solid outputs um, that you can use. So what's cool is you can use this right now. and. What's all, but what I find even more interesting is they're incredibly open about what this model is good for right now and what it kind of falls short doing. So they say here that right now they're really great at general knowledge and expert knowledge, mathematics and logical reasoning, efficient and effective long context tasks, maybe like writing, and uh, working in their in primary languages, so specifically English. And there's some multilingual capability in Spanish, French, German, Chinese, Arabic, Japanese, and Korean, which even a year ago would have been seen as kind of a massively state-of-the-art thing. Now, what are they not good at? So curiously, this model is not good at coding, and I can kind of attest to this, uh, are not very good. Um, precise numerical calculations also a place where it misses, which is interesting, but uh, when you think about wh how much sort of referencing is going on and, and how different this model does that, it's not as good. Counting R's in the word strawberry, so just a common benchmark, and uh, human preference optimization techniques um, really have not been explored here yet. So basically just optimizing for what humans like to see to give the impression a model is performing. So obviously it's very early. Um, they're still working hard to figure out what's actually going on. And if you're in Cambridge or you're in Massachusetts, you can actually come and look at their product launch event on October 23rd, which is also. So to wrap up the video, I'm going to try a few different prompts here. So we know it's not good at coding, but I want to show you something that it's actually quite good at. So right now I'm going to ask if I need to schedule multiple flights between Boston, MA, and Los Angeles. So the idea here is this is maybe something you'd want in an app or an assistant. And I will say the speed of this LLM is impressive. Obviously we're using their biggest variant here. Um, and right now you can use 40B and 3B. But um, yeah, they gave us a pretty decent breakdown. Book the flights, book the second flight, check in online. Um, and so I'm going to ask it sort of as a follow-on, um, 
when should I consider skick, but still giving us basically perfect language and reasoning that makes sense. So I just stepped into a new chat. And now to show you some of its shortfalls, I'm going to ask for a really basic Python function. So I'm going to say, write a basic Python function that will count the number of characters in an input string. So the tooling is here, like clearly it can understand what forms of output are, and it's good at really simple things, along with uh, giving kind of theoretical test output. Now, I, I assume if I ask Haitian based on IP address. So this is somewhere where supposedly it will really kind of struggle. And for instance, yeah, so this is a great example. So it just had us install a single dependency, gave us a function, and then totally drops the ball on how to even present this in a browser. There's no HTML here, there's, there's nothing. So for larger coding tasks, clearly it breaks down. And this is their 40 billion parameter model. Uh, it was fast, it was eager to give us some kind of result, but, cl but clearly this is where it falls short. Now for something that I think it might actually do quite well, now I wanna ask some reference information. I'm going to ask uh, if I plan to build a house in the forest in California, are there certain building codes I should be aware of? Two relatively vague questions, but this is something that in theory it should know how to do. So it brings up building permits, zoning laws, environmental regulations, fire safety, etc. I don't think this was trained on necessarily the best data, so it doesn't give me any real context about any of, of these things, but it gives me the most information about using lumber from the forest itself. So now I'll ask, what kind of trees are best if I want to mill my own lumber? These grow in northern. And I will say the, the largest model here, it sounds and feels like using a really, really rudimentary model from maybe six to eight months ago. And, and I mean, it feels like a one billion parameter model. So I'm sure that there's ability here. I'm sure that there's a lot of uh, performance and capability to unlock, it just doesn't seem like it's there quite yet. And granted, having this set up right now, having these initial models released is really impressive. But if anything, it brings up questions as to what is really being benchmarked on MMLU, specifically with reasoning. Because obviously there's machine reasoning and then there's the ability for these things to be used uh, actively. And what's good is it did give us examples of some that are native, but the funny thing is in this initial list, it did give us um, a bunch of trees that are not in California. For instance, teak is not in California. It even tells us right here. Incense cedar is native to California, but there are a number of others it doesn't really show here. So I'm eager to see what updates they release. It's always cool to see a new architecture that is coming out that isn't just Mamba or Transformers based. And yeah, so I'm curious what you guys think. Um, I wasn't necessarily the, the most impressed, but clearly this is a functional model and it's meant to work on a number of different process, on a number of different, on a number of different platforms. And I think models that can be built once and then deployed to a number of platforms are probably where the future of these, of this technology will go. Uh, George Hotz has talked about this, the idea of there being kind of a kernel that is AI, I think is quite interesting. So what do you guys think? Would you use this model? Do you think it's kind of not that useful? Are you maybe just not interested in models that can't do coding or that can't do simple things like the strawberry test? Let me know in the comments below. As always, um, I hope you learned something. There's also a new Vast AI link below for basically the best prices on compute. And um, yeah, I hope you learned something. And so if you like our content, please like, subscribe, and share, and we'll see you in the next one.